Please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. You'll find the page numbers in the service sheet. And just a reminder that we have a playroom over there, so any um, parents with young children who you think would cope better in the playroom uh, for uh, the next few minutes, then uh, please do make use of it. Uh, you can still hear what's going on through there, so um, you're very welcome to do so. Uh, we've been reading through the life of Abraham, and we come now to what is the climactic, in some ways the final key event of his life. He lived a long time after this, but this is the most significant uh, moment when all his, which all his life in some ways has been leading up to. So Genesis chapter 22, let's give careful attention to the word of the living God. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the woods. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, 
your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. And this is the word of God. Let us bow our heads and pray. God, our Father, we pray that as we consider this extraordinary story, that we would know that this event that took place so long ago teaches us to look to the mount upon which you provided and to give our all in service and sacrifice to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the, uh, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we read about in our first reading, uh, stands as the central event, really, of all of history. It is one that turns everything upon its head. What happened that day upon that mountain transformed not just the history of the world, but transformed the lives, the hopes the possibilities, the future of, well, all of mankind, but particularly for the descendants, both physical and spiritual, of Abraham. And this uh, event in Abraham's life, this climactic event for his, and undoubtedly the most single most significant event in Isaac's life, his son, s- speaks to us of both what would happen all those years later in the same place and speaks to us of what it means for us. We live in a nation that says to us, you must follow your heart, you must insist on your rights, you must fulfill your dreams, you must be your true self, you must live your best life. Jesus' words, however, were, whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. And I particularly think about those words of Christ tonight in our evening service. I do encourage you to come back. But his point was you must give up everything in the service of Jesus Christ. And this event, 1,800 years before Jesus, therefore nearly 4,000 years ago, is at the fountainhead, really, of what it means to find life by giving up yourself. Really, I only have two points today, although the um, first point has a number of uh, bits to it. Here is the, the key point. You owe God everything. You owe God everything. That the key to understanding this passage is, uh, it is to know who Abraham and Isaac are. Abraham is the ancestor of all of God's redeemed people in the Bible. That is Israel in the Old Testament, which becomes a Christian church in the New Testament. And even if he is not, as for most of us is true, your blood ancestor, he is your spiritual ancestor. He is the man from whom a a new redeemed human race is to arise. All nations, he'd been told many years now before this event, will be blessed through him. His descendants will inherit first this land in which he's living uh, at the moment as a sojourner, as a a guest, Uh, but ultimately they will inherit the earth. And there's a symmetry between this chapter and the first time we meet Abraham in chapter 12, uh, when in that God there also called him to get up and to leave the place he was in and to travel uh, somewhere new. And similarly, Abraham gets up and does it. Abraham is the father of all those who are saved. Isaac is his very long-awaited son. When Abraham had left his homeland, about 40 years before, probably, he had no son. 
Uh, and, uh, and God had made an oath to him that he would have descendants as many as the stars in the sky. But that, for years, that promise remained unfulfilled. He, his wife still had no children. Uh, there was a hiccup when, uh, foolishly and sinfully, uh, uh, they decided to try and get a child through another woman, successfully, but not the child God had promised, and introduced many sadness into their lives. And so there have been years and years and decades and decades of sadness until finally, at the age of 125 years after God's first promise, by his miraculous intervention, when Sarah, Abraham's wife, was 90 years old, a son was born, and his name was Isaac. It means he laughs. Now, this is a passage full of uh, wordplay and ironies. Uh, If you know that Isaac means he laughs, then every time his name is mentioned as they are traveling to the place where Abraham is expecting to sacrifice him, that the, 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 the pain of that irony, the son of laughter is to die, is unbelievable. Similarly, the name of the place to which they're going, uh, Moriah, uh, which, uh, which means, well, it means the Lord sees. It also means the Lord provides. It is a play on the word inside. And so every time we get seeing or providing in this chapter, uh, it's playing on those words. But the point to get is this, is that, is that Isaac is the totality of Abraham's life's work. Everything that he has lived for, all his hopes, all God's promises, the one thing for which he had waited and waited, and the, the whole purpose for which God had called Abraham, that is so that through his descendants, all the nations of the earth should be blessed. All of that is is in Isaac. That the hope of the world, the future of God's people, or we could put it slightly more personally, Isaac is everything about your life if you are a Christian. He he sums up everything about you. It, It is through Isaac's life, through his body, that salvation will come to the world, for it will be through his descendants. We were all, if you like, there in that terrible three-day journey. In a sense, we still are. Everything is in Isaac. And God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. We, We can't, of course, imagine what this was like for Abraham as everything that he had lived and hoped for appears somehow to vanish before his eyes. How could God, who had promised this son, now tell him to kill him? They've got to the stage where Isaac is a healthy young man. The word is translated boy in our uh, our version of the Bible, but it can equally mean a young man. He's he's strong enough to carry the wood, so he's he's not a little boy. Uh, So he's either a a teenager or in his 20s. And all of that, this 40-year hope, now God says to Abraham, give it to me. Give him to me. You owe me everything. Now, I've got to deal with the obvious thing, which rises in our hearts as we think about this. Human sacrifice is an abominably wicked thing. Uh, And there is no book on earth which is more clear about that than the Bible. That's really important to know. There have been no people on earth who have been more clear about that than Israel and the Christian church. We, We are the people who know that children's lives are to be protected and valued. In fact, in significant measure, that is because of this chapter. We know by the end of the chapter, God won't have it. Even from the greatest man of faith ever, he will not, he will not require uh, that we would ever kill our children. And that is part of the point. God's request to Abraham makes no sense to him. How could God want Isaac dead when everything he's promised for the last 40 years has been about making Isaac alive? And yet God asks Abraham to do it and to take this three-day journey to this mountain which he will show him and to, to give him as a burnt offering. 
Now, the, the, the word there literally means a, an offering that is to ascend to God. It's a standard word for one of the key types of offering that, with the, uh, that the people of Israel were later commanded to, uh, to give, where an animal was not just killed for God, but completely burnt up and consumed by fire and, and ascended to heaven in a cloud of smoke, which speaks of kind of total devotion to God, giving body and soul to God so that there is nothing left. So, children, I'm sure you like giving presents to your brothers or sisters or your mums or dads or maybe your grannies or grandpas at Christmas. It's fun giving presents to people. But imagine if you wrapped yourself up and gave yourself as a present. So that's it. This is me. I now belong to you completely. That's what Abraham is called to do. And he owes God everything. Now, we should just zoom in on some aspects of this. You owe your existence to God. You owe your existence to God. You see, Isaac only exists because God miraculously brought him into being. He, He is an impossible baby, born to a woman way past the age, able to conceive children, to a man, a hundred years old, as good as dead, we're told later in the Bible. He only exists in the first place because God made him. And so God says, give him up to me. You've got to acknowledge he owes his existence to God. You've got to be ready to surrender it. And that remains true of us. We are all only here because of God's kindness. We, we don't have an independent right to life. We didn't put ourselves here. God did. We have life because God kindly decided to give it to us. And so the challenge is, as it was for Abraham and Isaac, will will you recognize it? Will you surrender any kind of rights before God? Will you admit that he owns you completely because he made you in the first place? Will you put yourself wholly at his disposal? You owe your existence to God. You owe your obedience to God because we belong to God. Therefore, we owe him absolute obedience. We we are obliged to do what he says. That is the test for Abraham, isn't it? Will he do what God says? Again and again, will you do this? And after he's done it, it's because you have done this and have not withheld your son. Now, notice here that obedience doesn't depend on us understanding why God has asked us to do something. Abraham can't possibly understand why. His obedience is because he does it anyway. Now, this is really hard for us. We find it hard to obey when we don't understand why. Children, you know this, don't you? That if your mum or dad tells you to do something, very often your answer is, why? Why do I have to do that? And it's not wrong to ask that question, but... Even if you don't get an answer, or you don't understand the answer, or you don't agree with the answer, you still have to obey. But that is true of all of us, whatever age we are. God loves to help us to understand his ways. The Bible is full of him doing that. I think by the end of this chapter, Abraham and Isaac understand in a way they couldn't to start with. But obedience, the obedience we owe God, is to say, I will do what you say because you are God, even though I don't understand it. Far too often we make our obedience dependent on whether we agree. But that is not obedience at all. We owe God our obedience. Thirdly, you you owe your life to God. Now, I don't mean the same as you owe your existence to God. What I mean is this. Our lives are forfeits to God. We owe it to God to hand over our lives to him to death. We deserve to lose our lives from him. Why? Because we have not lived righteously as he's required. To put it bluntly, that the son on whom the hope of all the world depends, Isaac, 
does not deserve to live. That's part of what's going on in this, in this chapter. Isaac needs to know, and Abraham needs to know, and all of Isaac's descendants, and that includes all of us, needs to know that we don't actually deserve to go on living. We have not earned a right to be here. That our disobedience to God and the darkness of our hearts and the things that we have uh, wanted and desired and the things that we've said and the ways we've acted, all of them mean that God has every right to put us to death. In fact, the same point is made in Christian baptism. <coughs> baptism means a number of things, but one of those things is that it, it's a sign that you deserve to die. It is, in a way, an outrageous thing that we baptize our children. This lovely new baby does not deserve to live. It should be buried. Every adult who comes to baptism comes saying, my life should end because of what I have done. To pay for our sins, what we would need to pay is far more than we ever could. What we owe to God for who we are and what we've done is worth more than the entire value of our lives. You owe your life to God. Lastly, you owe your whole self to God. In a sense, this is the thing that sums up all of the other things. God says to Abraham, if you are going to enter life, if all my promises that I've made to you for the last 40 years are to become real, you must give me everything, your whole self, your entire life, everything you've longed and hoped for, everything you value, everything I've given you, you've got to hand it over and be willing to lose it. And how stark that is in this story. God just gives this instruction. Take your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I'll show you. And Abraham gets up and he goes the next day. It's three days' journey. Three times Abraham has to lie down and try to sleep, knowing what is coming. And, and the next day, get up and start traveling again towards the place where this terrible thing has to be done. They see the place from a distance. God shows it to them. And, 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 and seeing the awful thing that he has to go to, Abraham keeps going. Now, we don't I say we don't know how old Isaac is, but he's old enough to understand there's something strange going on and to carry the wood, as I said. And he asked, where is the lamb? And can we imagine the agony in Abraham's minds? But still he trusts God. His words are really striking. Verse 8, as Isaac asks, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Abraham is not lying. This is a great statement of faith. He doesn't know how God will provide, but he believes that he will. And as they climb the mountain and Abraham lays the wood in order, and at some point, we're not told when, Isaac must have realized what is happening and apparently did not resist. And Abraham bound him, tied him up, laid him on the wood, and he took the knife to slay his son. And this is the point. Will Abraham give everything up to God? Will he believe that his promises are good, even if it means losing everything? Will he trust that God has even this under his control? Will he be willing to face the loss of everything, his dearest hopes and dreams, for the sake of obeying the one true God? Will he believe that somehow, even though he cannot see how, if he loses everything for God's sake, somehow God will bless him and bring blessing out of this? That is the question for Abraham, and that is the question for all of us. To be a Christian is to be a descendant of Abraham. It is to share in the faith of Abraham. So here is the question. 
Will you give everything to God? Will you come to him and surrender everything? Will you believe that you only exist because of him? Will you believe that you are bound to obey him, whether you understand him or not? Will you accept that your life is forfeit to him for your sins? And that everything you have must be given to him. He demands from us nothing less than that. That There is no halfway Christianity. You can't do half-hearted Christianity. You can't be a passenger Christian or a sort of Christian. You can't opt in but kind of basically keep most of life the same. No, you've got to be ready and willing at God's command to lay everything you value even life itself, on the altar before God and reach for the knife to kill it. Now, if you're not a Christian, that means you must be willing to give up on everything that you plan for the future. I think sometimes people who aren't Christians think that Christians are kind of, that we want to try and entice you in with sort of, yeah, it's quite nice and good being a Christian. Well, there are many things that are nice and good about being a Christian, but don't get the wrong idea. What God calls you to is an utter surrender of everything. Say goodbye to how people think of you. Say goodbye to where you thought your life was going. Be ready to have your whole life shredded before your eyes. If if you're if you've grown up as a Christian, so children, this is you. Perhaps you're at the stage where you're almost not a child anymore. Then the same challenge comes to you. Will you sign your life away in the service of Jesus Christ? Will you say, okay, whatever it is that you want, whatever it is you ask, I will give it. I will do it. Even if you lose everything that other people in this world think matters. And actually, if you've been a Christian for years, the same challenge is there for you. Will you trust? Will you give it? Will you hand everything over to God? And if you do, and here is the second and the central point of this passage, if you do, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham reached out his hands, took the knife to slaughter his son, And then at verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven at this very last moment and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. Don't touch Isaac. Don't harm him. And instead, Abraham looks up. Again, this pun on the word for look or provide. And there, provided instead, is this ram caught in the thicket by his horns. You see, everything God asked for Abraham was right. This is what you need to give me. But now, look, here is a replacement. Here is the ram. Here's one who will die instead of Isaac. God requires everything from us. But when we are willing to give it all to him, he says, but I will pay. It is God who provides the offering. Abraham did not lose his son and Isaac did not lose his life. For on that mountain, God provided. And when we do come to God to offer ourselves completely without reserve, what we find is that God does not destroy us. Instead, he destroys another instead of us. For God provided one who gave himself. It was a ram for Abraham and Isaac. And this will be enacted countless times. For this is the same mountain upon which, a few hundred years later, the temple was built in Jerusalem. It's the very same place. And so again and again, this was reacted out as people came to offer themselves to God, but instead of them, there was a ram or a lamb or a bull that died again and again. But there would be another son of Abraham who would climb the slopes of this same hill to the same place of sacrifice. And he too would have the wood 
for his execution on his back. And he too would be bound and fixed to it. And this time, there would be no substitute, no provision of another, because he is the sacrifice. He is the one provided. As Jesus climbed the hill and was nailed to his cross, having been bound to it, and the crowds jeered, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He did not save himself because he was saving others. God did provide on the mountain. Not quite exactly the same mountain, for Jesus was led out of the temple, just outside the city, to another, to the hill, called the place of the skull, Golgotha in Aramaic, Calvary uh, in Latin. And on that hill, he was killed instead of us. How could God do it? Because it was God's son himself. God himself paid And as the Son of God lost his life, we received ours back. And if you can imagine the moment in Isaac's life where he sees the knife in his father's hand and hears the voice from heaven, and the knife is not used to kill him but to kill the ram instead, and all that happens now is that his his cords are cut and he is set free, and he goes on to live his whole life knowing that God provided one who died instead of him. The Son of God stepped into our place. This is how Christian faith works. This is what it is to be a Christian. It is to be called to give your all to God and find that God himself pays. The Son of God lost his life, and we receive it back. Those who surrender everything to God find that what they gain is infinitely better than what they thought they were going to lose. And so it remains for me to challenge you this morning. Will you trust this God? Will you give your life in his service? Will you lay everything on the altar before him? Because if you will, you will find that on the mountain of the Lord, he has provided for you. Well, let's pray to our Lord, shall we? God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are the God of infinite mercy and that you call us to give you everything for we owe you everything. But knowing that we cannot pay, you have provided your own son, to be the one who pays in our place. We praise you, Father God, that just as Isaac and all of Israel descended from him knew from this moment onwards, we too know that we would not be here. We would not have heard of your salvation. We wouldn't have been brought from death to life. We would have no hope were it not for the fact that you provided the one who stepped into our place. And so, God, our Father, we pray that we will hand all things over to you, for you have given your very Son for us. In Jesus' name, amen.